So yeah, Keith said, oh dear, the Lynx marketing department on Twitter said, oh gosh. Um, this, is, this is, oh flip, I think I'm running a software company. Um, why did I come up with this, this talk? Well, to explain that, I'll have to tell you a little bit about me, so forgive the um, slightly gratuitous uh, explanation of my CV so far, but, but it has a point. Um, I got into this industry about 10 years ago when I took a job with a, a small hosting company uh, as a sysadmin, basically. I knew nothing about sysadmin. I, I just about scraped through a computer science degree, and somebody provided me with a some Linux servers to look after, and I kind of had to figure it out. Um, that seemed to go okay, I guess. Um, I got into managing uh, their routers as well, and they had some Cisco switches and Cisco routers, um, and found myself applying for a, a job as a network engineer at Lynx. And um, for some reason that's completely unknown to me, uh, they hired me. In fact, the man responsible is sitting in the audience at the moment. Um, I, I'm, uh, again, I, I didn't really feel like I knew very much about networking at all, um, but uh, somehow I, I muddled through um, and uh, made my way up to senior network engineer, um, at which point somebody gave me some management responsibility and I ended up running projects and programs delivering network capacity upgrades and things and I even took my PRINCE2 exam and still don't really understand what project and program management's all around, about. Um, and it got to the stage where I was managing a pro project uh, to deliver a new Lynx stats platform. Um, the old one was, was falling over, not coping with the, the amount of traffic um, that, that Lynx were generating towards it. Uh, particularly in terms of the flow data, the S-flow and IP fix data. Um, and so um, I kind of came into to managing a, a software team via, via the back door there. Um, and, and I now have the somewhat um, grand and undeserved title of uh, software engineering manager at, at Lynx. Um, in my spare time, I like to pretend like I'm some kind of Red Bull-sponsored extreme athlete um, I go whitewater kayaking and rock climbing and stuff, but the truth is I'm not very good at any of those things either. Um, I guess the, the common theme here is, is uh, somehow I, I don't, I've never felt like I've really known what I'm, what I'm doing or what I'm up to. Um, uh, and my hope is that there are people in this room who, who have found themselves in, in the same position as me, um, and and are faced with a, a kind of a transition, especially in the um, the networking space. There's a lot of traction around um, these terms like SDN, NFV, network config automation, um, and, and are finding that they're transitioning more and more to a sort of software world. Um, and that's. Uh, not the slide I was expecting. Um, and so uh, they're transitioning more and more towards a, a, a software world and um, uh, have felt a little bit lost. And, and over the last year and a half-ish while I've, I've been doing this role, um, I've thrown myself into learning as much as I possibly can about how software teams work and uh, how, how people actually build, uh, successfully build bits of software. Um, and so, so I'll try and try and pass on to you some some of those uh, those those learning points, I guess. Um, so, so why do I care about building the software? This, this quote from from a, a man called Mark Andres and um, software is eating the world. I, I, I love that. Um, it conjures up to me the idea of. Um, the, the world kind of been overtaken, you know, not just networking, but any business, I'm, I'm sure, is, is feeling this kind of creeping um, software uh, infiltration of, of the tasks that were once done manually or, or by um, <coughs> specialists, and, and more and more people are building software to, to do that. Um, I mean, you pr already have huge amounts of software, I'm sure, in, in your organizations. We're a tech 
sector, um, we had, you know, and still have customer and service databases, config backups, and we have rancid um, modif- custom written ma- rancid modifications backing up our network configs. Um, generating monitoring configuration. So a lot of our kind of Nagios config is being generated by scripts out of a hardware inventory. Um, We have numerous, and I'm sure, um, like Arthur alluded to, uh, scripts that people have written over the years um, that are variously version controlled or not um, to do various different tasks that at some point an engineer has wanted to do and, and needed a script to do it. Um, and there's reporting tools and monitoring scripts and all, all of those kind of things. Um, uh, our story was that, that we didn't, we, we'd never really taken this stuff seriously. We, we saw, um, we, we had all of this stuff spread around quite a lot of places. There was no real version control. There was an SVN server that some people knew about that they che- sometimes checked stuff into. Um, but quite a lot of this was, was sort of unmaintained. And we had an entire network monitoring system that um, had been written at some point by a, by a, a previous Lynx employee. Um, and it was not version controlled at all. There was no documentation for it. Um, and so, so we kind of had to, we, the, the stat system was in this same position and we didn't have the necessary sort of knowledge to, to, to pull this over the line and actually deliver something. Um, so we've gone from that situation to, to having, um, putting together to the team that I, I run, um, and we're now managing, um, 25 products, uh, 50 plus code bases in in under version controls. Um, there's a fair amount of code there. Um, we're deploying to 80 plus servers, and we're doing all of this um, in in hopefully kind of what what are considered reasonably good um, software development practices um, that we've learned along the way. So. In, in the sort of style of a, a BuzzFeed article, eight things I wish I knew before starting a software team. The first thing we had to do was put a team together. Um, and uh, hiring was actually really difficult. Uh, we, to start with, um, I came from a networking background, so I didn't really know how to hire network engineers. Um, I think the, the, the kind of key points, um, to start with, we tried to find either network engineers who could write software or software developers who could understand networks, and those people are rare. Um, the, it, it, we really had a hard time finding, um, finding anyone at all that, that sort of fit that bill. Um, so I stepped back a little bit and said, okay, well, what, what are the fundamental? And I took, took some advice, and it's old advice, um, but I still think it's relevant, um, from, from a, a blog, Joel on Software, um, chap behind uh, Fog Creek, uh, Fog Bugs, and, and um, more, more lately, the kind of Stack Overflow and... Um, uh, server fault type type websites uh, who says hire smart people who get things done and um, that's that's really worked for us so we, we made sure that we were were hiring um, software engineers who who could pick up the networking stuff and who had a track record of actually delivering software products um, and, and that's worked really well we had to build a team culture with those people that we hired uh, this is a, a photo I took um, of our team uh, giving their presentations that we ha- hold every so often a, a, a hack day where the team can work on a, a, a kind of project of their small project of their own choosing um, and, uh, and and that's really helped kind of bond people and ensure that they're, they're working together well. Um, other things that we, we do um, to ensure that, that people are, are kind of working well together, we've made sure that we've focused on uh, 
delivering software as, as a key kind of thing that we want to do, um, delivering it in, in quality as well. So all of those things that Arthur was talking about, automated tests and um, code reviews and those kind of things, we've, we've built all of those practices in almost to the team culture. So people are kind of uh, delivering that feedback and checking each other um, all of the time to ensure that everybody is kind of on board with this this kind of... It's making it sound like a bit of a cult, but uh, but really it's 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 a productive cult, um, and we're we're hopefully um, delivering something that's uh, ni nice and, and high quality. We had to learn what this agile thing meant, and 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 actually that that to me was not just following an agile practice, but understanding why you are doing these strange things like doing daily stand-up meetings where you give each other updates, um, why you're getting together every two weeks and, and planning your, your sort of short-term short goals for the next two weeks, why you're reviewing on this kind of fairly rapid cycle um, how it's going and how the team's working and, and that, all that kind of thing. And gaining an understanding of the different practices, Scrum, Kanban, the sort of wider, lean um, kind of community um, became quite important. This is one that I learned the hard way, um, managing the user's expectations. Um, so, so I came in and I said, we can do all of this really cool stuff and it's easy to get overexcited um, about all of the stuff that you might be able to do with software within a, an organization um, because a lot of it is possible and, it, and, and but it does take time and we had um, a huge amount of, of kind of legacy code that we had to um, pick up and maintain and all of that was was a time sink and, and, and that um, kind of idea of this technical debt that's building up um, uh, as you develop code and you don't follow these, these sort of constant practices of, of uh, testing and, and refactoring um, becomes, becomes a, a big stopper in the way of actually getting things done. So, so being able to say, hey, look, guys, we will deliver some stuff, but we're also working to fix all of these practices and, uh, as we go along um, was, was a message that I didn't get across early enough, I guess. Um, so I mentioned technical debt. This is the idea that um, as you write code, uh, you, you introduce more and more complexity. And at some point, you have to deal with that complexity and maybe look at better ways to structure whatever you've written. Um, and it, really, it can, you can get into the situation that this, this cartoon is trying to uh, illustrate, which is, you know, you think you have to keep going forward, so you're not going to accept the, the, the time taken to improve your system. Um, and, and taking time to improve the system really does pay off. So this is more from the kind of um, startup world. Um, but the idea is that you, you should take risks. You know, you, you should try features or, or changes that... Um, uh, uh, perhaps you know you're not sure if they're going to work or not, um, but you need a safety helmet, um, and and that that has to be um, failing fast. You know if if something doesn't pay off or if if usage does goes down of whatever software you're using or or you start getting negative feedback from users, then then you should be able to roll back and and um, so it's quite important that you measure. And I came across this, I quite like this, this term, hypothesis-driven development. Um, the idea is you're, you're applying a scientific method to um, developing software. And so you say, I think that by changing the data structure of the statistics we're holding in the database, that the performance of the stat site is going to be 10 times faster, or faster in general. Um, but you have to measure that first and then make the change and then see if the numbers have changed. Um, you, ha you have to be able to prove that, that hypothesis. And uh, Arthur's already stolen the thunder on this slide. Um, the, 
you're trying to avoid this situation, right? That, I mean, the, the the whole sort of DevOps approach, the the idea that um, you, you have this this kind of joint responsibility between development oper operations, and that's where the the culture element comes in, um, is that um, you 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 have to. Um, you have to ensure that, that you're jointly responsible for, for whatever it is you're, you're producing. So the, um, the hardest part of this for me was, was convincing people. And, and so I was running a software team. We have a systems team as well. And, and trying to get the guys talking to each other and, and ensuring that, that we're all on the same page about some of the stuff we were doing. We'd, we'd, we've been driving the adoption of Ansible for managing the systems within, our, uh, within the organization. And um, the, the systems guys saw this as a little bit of a kind of treading on their toes. So I had, had to try and get them on board, and, and luckily they, they now are, um, and are adopting it. But we really had to kind of champion this from, from my team and, and ensure that we were kind of um, educating them and training them and helping them take, take that, that uh, side of things on. So we're now at the point where we're beginning to tackle network automation um, as the, the next challenge that, that we're, we're, we're adopting. And, and we're trying to apply some of these principles and some of these things that we've learned um, to, to that network automation. And it sounds very similar to the, to the work that Arthur's been doing. Um, we kind of had the requirements, because uh, we run several different networks, um, that this platform, whatever we build to configure the network, has to be um, cross-platform. So it has to talk to Juniper devices, extreme devices. Uh, we've recently announced that we're going to be using some edge core devices. Um, and, you know, even... Um, data center interconnect kind of optical um, platforms, they all have config too, so I don't see a reason why they sh it shouldn't be able to talk to, um, to those devices as well. Um, we wanted to make sure that we, we kept uh, the ability for engineers to, to manually intervene, especially in the middle of the night when they're on call. We don't want them to have to um, go through some kind of system or... or um, change that requires code review or anything, they might be the only guy that's there making the change. Um, so it could be, uh, particularly to start with, a, a barrier to, to them making the change. So um, we wanted to kind of maintain that ability to, to make a quick fix if, if something was wrong. Um, um, key to, to the kind of agile thing was being able to approach the solution uh, kind of iteratively. So start small and build up into something that, that was actually delivering um, the, the kind of benefits of automating the whole network. So our approach is um, not burn it all from, with fire. Um, we're going to use a library that's called Napalm. Um, which is actually a, a, an Ansible library, so it's a, pop, it's a Python um, module that plugs into to Ansible. Um, and it was built by the nice people at Spotify and um, a, a few others as well as a kind of collaborative effort. But the idea is it provides a vendor agnostic um, plugin into Ansible to deploy configs that you generate from a template into um, a network device. So. Um, our, our general flow is, is that we're going to fetch the current config from the network device itself. That's our source of truth. Um, we'll have a, a Git repository, version controlled repository of previously applied configs and the latest one of those is what we think the network state should be in. We can compare those two. So we can say, is how we version controlled, have we got the latest state of the network? Uh, does that match um, reality or... And, and if it doesn't, then, then we're, for now, just going to bail out and say, okay, there's, there's a difference here. Somebody manually needs to intervene. Either they need to commit a change um, that hasn't yet been committed into, into the repository, or they need to go and make the changes on the router to make it match the, the current config. If those configs match, uh, then we generate a candidate configuration. We Two things from that. We need a template. 
um, and we need the variables that are going to populate that template. So um, the language that Ansible, or the sort of format that Ansible is written in is, is YAML, uh, YML. Um, and so initially that's going to be um, our format for our, our kind of service inventory that, that represents all of the, the elements in the network. Um, and, and those two things combined should give us enough to um, configure a, a, a network device. We can at that point compare the current configuration with our candidate configuration. Um, if there's any difference, we can apply those and succeed and store the, the applied config. If there's no difference, then that's keeping that item potence that Arthur was talking about. Um, we can succeed and say, well, there's no change needed. We don't need to apply anything. So where does this, this um, service inventory come from? Well, we've got quite a few different databases of, of various different um, types. We have a service inventory that tracks which ports are assigned to which links, links members, what's plugged into them, what MAC address is present there, what IP address is assigned to that member. Um, we have a hardware inventory which stores um, information about where the routers are, what line cards are plugged in, what optic types, what other modules. Um, and we still have some kind of logical config as well. We, we have a custom written um, LSP planning tool which um, maps the network and, and plans LSPs across it. Um, and we will probably find that we need other logical config um, in an inventory as well, and I suspect that there's some work to do to, to document that, um, where it's just stored in, in router configs at the moment. Um, we spent quite a lot of our last uh, year-ish building a, an API um, that's a RESTful API that interacts with these systems. Um, so we can quite easily pull the data out of that API, generate the YML, um, and commit it into a, a Git repository so that we have version control of that service inventory over time. So this is hopefully going to deliver completely automated config validation. Um, if we apply those kind of DevOps principles and that, that kind of build chain that we've built for some of our software, we can do syntax validation. We could even um, do the kind of automated testing things, um, particularly with tools like Junos Sphere for the Junos routers. We can upload the configs into that and do some automated reachability tests. Um, we can apply um, detail from the stats system to do capacity. How, if we change these LSPs, will there be enough bandwidth to, um, to cope with, with the demand where the traffic's rerouted? Um, to start with, uh, we'll be very much um, making, a, uh, making a, a change with a, a commit to a template, and then a network engineer will press the button and watch it be applied. Um, Maybe at some point we can move on to continuous deployment once we're happy enough with the, the tests that are going on. Um, and, and more and more will get templated over time. So I think to start with, we're very much approaching it um, from the point of view that if we almost do a kind of reverse rancid, we have network device configuration in a Git repository, um, but on a per device basis, then we can apply that from there, and any changes can be committed to that Git repository and code reviewed, so a peer, you get a peer review um, from a, another network engineer um, to say, yeah, I think that's, that's looking good. Um, and you might get an automated test that runs um, to prevent you uh, merging that into the kind of master repository um, if the syntax, for example, doesn't validate. Um, so the idea is, is that over time we can, we can go more and more templated and, and provide more power in these kind of web front ends that are driving the, the underlying data. So I think I'm probably a little bit early on the uh, time. But uh, that, that is everything that I had to say. So if anybody's got any questions, I'd welcome it. On there. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Paul Tweedy, BBC. I was just wondering if um, in any of this, in this change from, you know, the kind of the, uh, the previous model to this DevOps model, did you have any measures by which you were kind of measuring the success 
I mean, uh, there's sort of an assumption that, well, this is better because, but I just wonder whether there's any kind of real metrics or measurables, even at a high level you might use to, to state that. So, um, I mean, that, that was one of the things that I think we could have learned better. Um, I, the one thing we have been measuring is, is release frequency on, on these, these pieces of software um, that were um, that we maintain and that we've kind of taken over maintaining from, from various individuals in the organization who were previously kind of just the one man responsible for it. Um, and, you know, we have improved release frequency mass massively. You know, the, there's a, a kind of internal um, sort of service inventory and customer relationship management uh, database, which we were doing one release on per year previously. Um, we're, I think so far this year, we've, we've um, there's something like 50 releases we've gone through already. So there's, there's getting that, that value to the users and, and um, Curtis and team are, are like our primary users of that system. Um, delivering to them has, has been um, quite a focus and, and so Getting that out to them has, has been um, been much improved, I, I think. Although uh, Curtis might argue with me. Okay. So Karim Ali from Central Nick, have you tried the RESTful API that Juniper released with Junos 14? No, not yet. Uh, we're still, I think, running 13 in in production. So um, we we haven't yet looked at, at 14. Right. If you've got any experiences with it, I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear what, what you've done. Well, that's what I was interested in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, not yet. Um. Okay, thank you, Colin. Oh, sorry. I hear Lynx have an exchange in Scotland. Would you like to tell us about it? <laughs> Yes, <laughs> um, we do. We have a, an exchange in uh, Edinburgh in the um, Pulsant South Gyle facility. Uh, it's called IX Scotland. Um, if anybody is interested in connecting and peering there, um, please do. Sorry, I'm not a salesman, so uh, that was my attempt. Yeah, yeah, Curtis gets to do that shortly. But <laughs> um. Okay, great. Thanks, Colin. All right.